morning with Wayne Patterson from Anteris. Wayne, good morning. Good morning, Andrew. Good to see you. Good to have you back, Wayne. Look, busy couple of weeks here for you. Uh, you've just attended London Valves, where you've had a number of podium presentations, plus this late breaker here. Tell us all about it. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I mean, we were we were thrilled with the reception at London Valves. Of course, it is the preeminent meeting uh, of that nature uh, in in Europe, and certainly one of the top two in the world, next to TCT. Um, and just a little bit on these kind of meetings. The, these kind of meetings are where the cutting edge breakthrough stuff is presented medically. Um, this is not a meeting you can just pay to show up at or uh, anyone gets invited along. So it's really important when you get invitations to these meetings that uh, that you're able to get onto the podium. It's also a validation of your data. Uh, you don't get near a podium if your data is not robust, legitimate, and so on. The attendees at these conferences, um, and again, this was the first time for London Valve post-COVID, like we saw with TCT recently, um, which is great to see. But these are the cutting-edge physicians from around the world that come to these meetings, as well as, of course, industry. Um, because this is where you see the new uh, late breaking stuff, and you talked about our late breaker. So you know, it's not that your your average doctor from somewhere you know in the far wilds of, of the world is is going to come along to these kind of meetings. It's really the guys who are you know on top of the research, on top of the podiums, well published, and so on. So it's a really important validation of your science and of your product if you are accepted or invited to present at these meetings. Now, late breaker that means you've got something even next level. Uh, to get a late breaker. Late breaker in itself is a concept that is just not something that comes along. Uh, we've got late breaker on the back of some of this flow information that's, that's started to float around recently. Uh, so Dr. Maduri Chris, our CMO, gave a fantastic presentation. I think a lot of people saw that. It was recorded. Um, and look, it was a packed, packed, packed auditorium uh, standing room. I mean, people were standing as well as seated. And the, the response was incredible. Uh, as well, Chris was able to uh, to make that late announcement about our EFS approval with the FDA, um, and so that was that was phenomenal. And and the amount of applause and congratulations to people that came up to me from industry and global physicians was just stunning, even for me uh, at the end of that meeting. So it was really really well received. Um, you know, we had a scheduled two uh, podiums that were formal. We ended up on the stage six times at different uh, parts of the Congress. Um, People who were presenting on our data uh, that we were not even aware of at times had picked up some of this data we were presenting on it as part of their presentation. So we got a lot of, of discussion, a lot of coverage, simply because this data is so fascinating uh, and so new uh, relative to what's available in the tab space. Well, Wayne, look, firstly, this new flow data showing Anteris to be superior to Medtronic and Edwards. Uh, tell us a bit about it, what it means. Yeah, so this is this is really revolutionary stuff. Again, for a small cap company, uh, this is more the kind of science that I'm kind of used to with where I came from in Big Pharma, where you really lead the discussion. The fact is, the simple fact is that the, the space hasn't really changed since these older products were introduced 25 years ago. They haven't really changed in their design. So what does all that mean? Uh, typically, I think um, they have discussed medically these valves in a bit of a vacuum. They've talked about the valve opens and closes. They've talked about the EOAs and the mean gradients, the blood flowers and the opening. Uh, and that's about it in terms of isolation. Um, we've started to move the science into a place where we talk about the disease uh, and what that means. Now, this valve is biomimetic, and that principle has been well accepted. And what that means is it's in a class of its own. So it's a new class of valve. All the other valves are you know, either bi bioprosthetic or mechanical. Um, and they fit into a different class. So, of course, when you bring in a new class, the bias prosthetic valves are, you know, decades and decades old, all of these three-piece valves. They give, by definition, very different results to the new class, the biomimetic valve, which is Duravar. So flow, what was what's just turned everybody on their ear at the moment is that flow is something that was not necessarily measured before, and we've understood that there are good reasons for that because we're now talking about not only the valve, but the effect on the left ventricle, the, the effect on the aorta, can it model, remodel LVH and so on. Um, and these things have been possible. Flow is a measurement that we look at, uh, reverse flows is particularly, we looked at a normal valve untreated. So these are in humans, 22 patients. Um, so we looked at a healthy valve, we measured the flows. So that is our benchmark, that's the baseline. Juravar was then shown to have exactly the same flow parameters as a normal untreated healthy valve. That's never been seen before. Uh, we then looked at a stenotic valve, a sick valve that hasn't been treated. We measured the flow on that. 
Uh, and what was surprising is when we measured the Edwards valve, particularly it had worse flow than the pretreated stenotic valve, the pretreated sick valve. And we've clearly demonstrated that in humans. I don't think anyone was expecting that, but it is a function of these, uh, you know, these bioprosthetic designs, these old class of, of valves have a different design. We also did better, of course, in the Medtronic valve, although they did better than the Edwards valve. Um, but being worse than a sick valve was pretty compelling. The other thing that we showed that hadn't been seen before was that our Tabar valve outperformed a surgical valve. Surgical valves usually outperform Tabar valves to a little extent. So not only did we perform the same as a normal valve, we have a pre-disease uh, healthy valve, but also outperformed the surgical valve. The rest of the data has got everybody talking, of course. And th this is not a small step. This is a huge step in this space. It will compel us to do more research. We're, of course, willing and happy to do that. But academics, clinicians from all over the world have come to us and said, can we study this aspect? So I believe that this is bigger news than we even imagined we had on our hands. We knew that this, this uh, single piece valve, this biomimetic valve was different. We knew it gave different results, but no one anticipated kind of the level of science. Now, what does that really mean for a shareholder? Uh, I think, you know, make no mistake, when you've got a product that appears to be so radically differentiated medically and clinically as this product is, uh, no matter where the share market in, is on any given day, uh, you can well expect that the medical science will lead the product to where it needs to go. Uh, by far, this product at the moment, based on the data we've got, is superior to everything we've put it up against. And we'll continue to do that, of course. Uh, and we should see the benefit of that in the clinic as we come into 2023. This other serious announcement from you, Wayne, regarding FDA EFS approval. That's another right. significant milestone. It's Well, it's massive, right? It's, of course, we've got human patients and they're doing wonderful, wonderfully, uh, and we'll be presenting some of that data very shortly on a 12-month follow-up. But, of course, FDA, is, as we all know, is not a simple process. I'm not sure if you haven't been through it, what you really appreciate about the FDA process. But in MedTech, it's even more interesting because you're not only looking at the medical function of the product, in our case, the valve, you're looking at the engineering aspect of the catheter and delivery system. So that's very different to drug. We just have to worry about the compound. So you're really getting very deep on, you know, the catheter, uh, the engineering of that, the quality of the engineering, uh, the materials you use, whether they're top, you know, a whole bunch of things. So it's not a simple process. It's the valve and the delivery system. Uh, so getting through that very rigorous process, as you can well imagine, is a huge validation of the, of the product's ability to be safe and effective. And I think those are two big parameters that you maybe worry about in the stock market a little bit about a spec speculative company. What it really means is this is not a matter of if. We, we we knew that that was not the case anyways, but of course, it's a public proof that it's it's more a matter of when with our product now because it's been validated as being safe and effective. On the back of that, the FDA, of course, reviewed the patient data that we currently have on the 13 patients. Uh, and of course, they are extremely compelling. We're very happy to share that data with them. So, uh, I think, you know, it is, it's huge. It's, I think it's a pivotal moment in the company's history where everyone will look back five years and go, okay, that was the turning point for, you know, public validation of safety and efficacy. What are you hearing, Wayne, from doctors as far as the progress that's being made? Yeah, look, you know, I, I think you know this. I've been around for a lot of years, two decades in global healthcare, all big pharma. But um, so therefore had have great discussions with physicians all around the world on different therapeutic areas at times when we've had breakthroughs. The level of discussion, and I, I mean this sincerely, when you know, when we're moving the science as quickly as we are as a company, uh, physicians are coming out of the woodwork everywhere who have a particular interest in this or flow or whatever. So we're meeting beyond our wonderful, uh, you know, world class medical advisory board. Uh, there are other physicians who understand flow and understand left ventricular hypertrophy and this and that and the other. Uh, all leading edge, high level physicians from around the world are coming out and talking to us because they've seen the data. So the, it's not just a couple of voices. There's just such a level of interest in, in the data that we're generating. And of course, in the data that we need to generate, let me be very clear, this is preliminary data. Um, we do have to do more data here, but of course our experience with the valve is that when you see it on the bench or in an animal and humans, it does replicate itself because we understand the reasons why. So the medical fraternity uh, all want to study this study that published this, published that about Juravar. Um, and and I, I think for the first time, there is a lot of things about the existing products that were known and understood, but there was no solution. So physicians didn't feel comfortable about that, talking about it, uh, because you still have to treat patients. Now that there's a viable solution, uh, you are definitely getting a, a far greater comfort level 
in physicians coming out and talking about the other products and some of the problems that they may have encountered and some of the deficits. So, you know, that, that viable alternative gives people a platform to have discussions. So I'm very excited about, you know, what this all means in 23 in terms of more publications, more data. Uh, certainly the more data you have, the more medically superior you are, obviously the higher the value to patients, to physicians, and of course to shareholders ultimately. Well, that's the commentary, I suppose, from doctors and physicians. What about the level of interest more broadly within industry? Yeah, so again, you know, talking to industry is not something that is a, um, you know, a small uh, or a short term impact. I think a lot of shareholders do talk to me about industry. Uh, and I think a lot of companies are always saying they're talking to industry uh, in the healthcare space. We actually are and have been for a long time. And, and that's what I did in my job before uh, in Big Pharma. So this is how this works. You, you, you spend a lot of time building up relationships at the, at the C-suite, at the highest levels. And then you get to know everyone else. They know you, they get to know your the doctors, of course, because the doctors usually have done work with them. Um, and so over time, you just keep building that credibility. Uh, so industry came out to a man and congratulated me at London Valve. People came up and who I knew, of course, from a different company, shook my hands. Uh, we had scheduled meetings with, with some of the bigger companies anyways. We already we always have those contacts with them. Uh, those meetings took on a different level of discussion again, um, as they do. But we have a lot of legitimate uh, ongoing meetings with the highest levels of these companies. Um, and each time we, we have these discussions, they've spoken to one of our doctors, uh, they've got their head around the data, they compliment us on, on that data. So, uh, you know, industry, of course, is very um, supportive. I think they're very congrat congratulatory towards us. I think at the same time, there's a couple of companies out there that have tab our products. Um, and of course, this data uh, for them is more than at an interest level. And Speaking to a couple of those companies, it's always interesting to me how much they know about our data because they really are deep on some of this stuff. Uh, so I think there's a bit of, uh, you know, watching, waiting, uh, and each time we present some data, that watching and waiting period has to be, has to take on a different meaning for some of them. But, uh, you know, we're friends with everybody as always until we're not. Some of these conversations and meetings with bigger companies, Wayne, do they involve conversations around potential partnering opportunities? Yeah, very much so. Um, and, you know, it, it's always, you're, you're doing a dance, I would say, quite a lot with these companies. Uh, I think partnerships are not something that's typically seen in this industry. They tend to buy out companies. Uh, and that's certainly my experience in, in the med tech space. And the reason for that is a lot of the companies are smaller um, and don't really have the ability to commercialize. So the bigger companies look at that and say, well, we can maybe watch and see whether you'll fail or succeed through a seat no risk. Um, and we know you probably can't come to market by yourself. So we'll make an offer, low ball, media ball, whatever it needs to be when you get all your approvals. Now, the difference for Antares and the, you know, the companies now know this. My team are all from Global Big Pharma, my management team. They have launched dozens of drugs globally. Uh, so we're very different to a small startup from wherever, uh, Minnesota or wherever. Uh, I think the companies are just catching up with the fact that we can go to market. We will go to market if we have to um, and, and create that viable threat. So that, that increases the value a lot. So I think people are starting to catch up with, uh, you know, acquisition um, at the right price, of course, is viable to us. At the wrong price, it's not. Partnership, uh, possibly, if that helps us get there quicker. Uh, wait and see, probably at a point of wait and see where uh, it gets a little bit too late for any of the big companies because at that stage, we won't need anything from them. And the share price will be dramatically higher, of course, for shareholders if we if we do end up going all the way. The real message here is we have the ability to take this. Uh, and by the way, the advisory board and our broader network already have about 25% of the volume, procedure volume in the US. Um, they kind of own this product. So we've got, you think about commercialization, I've, you know, I've rolled out thousands of reps and billions of dollars of product around the world in my past, but this is something else. You've got a captive audience of 25% before we lift a finger. Uh, assuming the data continues to be fantastic like it is. Uh, and those centers, of course, influence the others, so it goes. So this is not the massive undertaking that some might think it might be. And of course, then there is a process to pre-commercialize and launch. We're already in that process, actually, right now. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see on that, but we continue to have the discussions. We'll, um, we'll keep them where they need to be as, as they come along. And, uh, you know, we're going to go one way or another here. But like I said earlier, it's not a question of if anymore. Obviously, it's a question of when. Well, has a, has a number been put on what a product such as yours might be worth globally? And how does that compare with your market cap currently? 
Yeah, so it, it does. And it's, uh, I, I guess it's, you know, you look at the validation from London Valve, you look at what the physicians are talking about, and you know where this product's going to land. I've been through it a lot in my career. Uh, these are the guys that use the product. If you're clinically superior, you're going to be used. Um, if you get through the FDA and your catheter and delivery is safe, you're going to be used. Um, if you know how to commercialize, you're going to get it out there. So let's look at the market. It's, you know, it's $10 billion on the, on the predictions, US dollars by 2028. Um, and that's a bit of a moving target, depending on who you listen to. The the simple fact is that no one has really got a curative product. So this in itself, um, our product is obviously very different. What does that mean commercially? It means one thing academically, it means something commercially. So that market, we're treating maybe 20%, 15, 20% of patients now. So it, that 10 billion represents a very small number of treatable patients. If we then project and say, well, now there's not even a trade-off. If it looks to be a long-term product, if it gives you curative results, things that weren't available for normal flows, for example, um, that market will get bigger. So it's hard to say how big the market will be. But if we just go on what the New York analysts are saying about the market, it's 10. Uh, the leading product has 65% market share, right? So let's call that 6.5 billion US dollars. Um, and our product is significantly better than that product. And that's proven in the clinic. That's not me having to raise the flag. The numbers tell us that it's superior. They will continue to tell us that. So you take a product like that, put it at peak sales, give it a multiple of, I don't know, five. Uh, sounds all very unhinged from our current market cap. And in fact, it's realistic when you look at the how that breaks down. But what drives what this product will do will be the numbers in the clinic. And the, the, the clinical data to this minute tells us that it is the market leading product. Um, and if you if you know that to be true, and if you believe the academics at these conferences and the clinicians and physicians globally, then you should feel fairly safe in your investment that this uh, you know this is on a path now of uh, wherever it lands. It's a, it's a bigger number than where we are today. Always good to catch up, Wayne. Thanks for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Always good to see you.